orienteering costs a lot of more uh, energy than normal running. So you can... we were training like this week, every week, uh, the same, like English and uh, method, because I use a wrist compass. This, uh, I would see if I find it. I know, I, I saw it on one of the photos. Yeah, yeah, and that's not the best uh, for direction. Yeah, I realized it more and more the older I get that it's more of uh, the journey is the, is the goal, sort of. Welcome, everybody. Today I'm talking with Sarah Hexstrom. Do I say your surname correctly? Ah, uh, Hogstrom. Hogstrom. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Sarah Hogstrom, uh, and uh, you, we all know about her amazing performance during the uh, World Cup just last weekend, although you're probably going to be seeing this video a little bit further into the future. And uh, she was kind enough to join me for the chat. We've already had some conversation before uh, and we were talking a little bit about uh, her, how, how she's connecting working uh, with sports and also about um, her performances and um, feelings about work, uh, World Cup that happened in China. And also, uh, what else did we talk about? Yeah, about the split of forest and uh, sprint walks and the feelings about uh, the flow that happens in a, in a forest walk. So quite a lot of interesting topics and a lot of interesting um, things that we went through. And now it's time for the second part of our chat where we will focus more on the um, performance aspect of orienteering and also preparation for this maybe your results also in the past, and maybe your dreams for the future. Uh, so I think it's going to be interesting for everyone to hear. And uh, yeah, that's it. Welcome to the channel, Sarah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, so the, the first thing I want to start with is uh, I always like to learn how people got into orienteering just to understand how much experience you as an athlete already have. And I kind of suspect that you have quite a lot. Yeah, you said before it's uh, almost the same. Uh, I you expect almost the same story as uh, other Swedish runners, and yes. it's yeah, it's uh, it's almost the same. My parents uh, brought me into orienteering, but uh, they're not elite runners, or they haven't been doing orienteering for their whole life. Uh, also, my my dad started with orienteering due to some friends, and then he stopped uh, when he had some injuries, and then he came back orienteering when we were kids so he was almost or not a beginner but my mom was a beginner when when i was a beginner so yeah we st started the whole family me my older brother and uh, my younger sister and my parents um went to Uring and, and all the stuff uh, there so yeah i've been doing also some cross-country skiing and uh, athletics so we were a sporty family when i was a kid that's awesome I, I love hearing all the stories where the whole family is just going into orienteering. That's definitely one of the aspects of this sport that I absolutely love. That you uh, you don't join it yourself like in many other sports, but you join it yeah. very often as a family, and then it's 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 like a glue that is additionally connecting you and giving you a um, common thing to talk about and spend time in. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well. Uh, did you have orienteering at school? Because that's also something that many Swedish children are able to experience. Yeah, yeah. In Sweden, it's mandatory to have it in school. So, uh, but it's does it doesn't have a good rumor in in Sweden. It's uh, people are mostly often sick when it's orienteering. Interesting. Uh, because they don't like being out in the forest. And, oh, and really? Of course, some people like it, but I think the. Um, I mean, the foundations for orienteering is, is quite bad in the schools. Uh, you have to have a updated map in a good forest area and yeah. the teacher has to be good at orienteering to be able to teach it. And of course, in some schools, this is good, but uh, in some schools, they don't just do it because of uh, because they have to. And then it's like, yeah, a boring, non-updated map in a schoolyard and the people are walking and uh, yeah, it's not really or orienteering. But of course, it's good they they learn to read a map. But it's not, it's it's far away from the sport orienteering, and and that's why when I showed orienteering for my work colleagues and stuff, 
I, I put up some small cores with sporty dance and stuff. They, they were really happy and uh, liked it a lot. And like, yeah, this is not like school or engineering. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can do it in many different ways. And school or school or thing is mostly uh, maybe not so good. <laughs> Interesting. Did it did it change in some uh, past years? Because I, I think I remember conversations from like ten years ago. Uh, with people from Sweden when they said that lots of schools are doing orientation but nobody told me it's mandatory back then yeah yeah it is mandatory um I don't uh yeah yeah it, it is and has has been but uh, they're talking about taking it away uh, as mandatory and that would be a quite big loss for for the orienteering in Sweden because yeah of course it's mostly people start because it's in the family but uh, some people come from school also so mm -hmm. uh yeah, it would be sad if we lose that uh, uh, that uh, source of people. Yeah, I think so. Um, good. So basically, you started because of the family. What 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 age did you start at? Yeah, I was at the Udingen when I was five or okay. four. So so yeah. more than twenty years of experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, how do you remember your last two J walks? So I think it was. Bulgaria 2014 and Norway yeah. 2015 and at those jaywalks you were already presenting yourself as one of the best runners in the world at your age at that time um how do you remember that yeah I remember um I, I was uh, selected for uh, jaywalk when I was already 17 and that was a big surprise I didn't know it ex existed before we were just uh, doing orienteering in West Jutland where I grew up uh, but uh, yeah, then I was there and I, I got the fourth place and I was, whoa, I'm, I'm really good at this. And uh, yeah, then in uh, Czech Republic, I was uh, second behind Lisa Rispy. Uh, that was also a really cool experience. But then in, in Bulgaria, the year after, I was really dominating. It feels like I really found my peak in the in shape and technical uh, preparations and so. So that was really cool to feel that I could run like I could really run, um, not slow, but in, in the speed of my orienteering. Like, you know, the feeling when you are a bit stressed because you are too slow uh, and that makes you do some mistakes. But uh, at this day walk in Bulgaria, I could really rely on, on my pace and uh, yeah, be able to run. Uh, so your, uh, your physical run, shape like, was very good. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And also like the terrain, I think it suited me a lot with a lot of details, especially in the middle distance with the, uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah, depressions and uh, ridges, mm -hmm. what do you say? Yeah. And also Norway, uh, the, the my last year, I I struggled with some injuries before. Uh, so I was not sure about how my performances would be, but yeah, I, I managed to win the long distance and the relay there. And uh, the middle, I was doing a big mistake. And the sprint, I was disqualified because I went into a forbidden area. Um, so, I mean, the j is always a lot up and down. Uh, and uh, I think I learned a lot and got many new friends. So I really look back to those years uh, with joy. Cool. Well, is, it, is it motivating for you? Uh, or was it motivating for you to just, you know, push hard during the preparation season because there is J-Walk World Orienteering Championship for, for juniors? Was it like a competition that was grinding your gears? Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, as older I got as a junior, uh, the J-Walk was more important, of course. Um, but I don't think it's uh, that important as walk is now for me. Um, I think uh, we had a lot of other competitions uh, for juniors that were uh, important too, like Oringen and SM, uh, the Swedish Championships. And uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, and, and we weren't at so many camps as nowadays uh, for WOC. People are at so many camps and yes. uh, like almost uh, living at the place where, where it's supposed to go. And that's it, it's really cool that people put so much effort, effort in walk. But for gay walk, we were at the pre camp and then, yeah, we were at uh, day walk. So I tried to develop my technical skills at home and try to fi find the uh, relevant maps. But yeah, it wasn't that big effort for jay walk as it is at, for walk. I see. Very interesting. 
because for example in, in Poland for many runners Jairok is like a highlight of the season you know Polish yeah. champs are definitely not as important as uh, as a yeah. performance during the Jaywalk. I think I think nothing is so uh, we don't have Oringen of course uh, yeah. <laughs> and we don't have Tiomila uh, so the, there is a lot less to look to look forward to and uh, yeah I think that Jaywalk is is the highlight of the season for the people that are yeah. like 19 or 20 years old and this yeah. is where they are putting all their effort into and mm -hmm. as you said lots of lots of training camps uh, are definitely yeah. structured for okay. uh, the Jaywalk terrain in mind keeping yeah. Jerry terrain in mind so that that's, that's very interesting to hear but I, but I also uh, I have been talking during my years as a coach of the national team I have been talking with uh, the coaches from from Sweden Norway Finland and I think it's very similar across those three countries that they said that for many years, um, probably not all three, but I think Sweden didn't even go to European Euro Youth Championship at all, right? Um, and you yeah, have no for, representation for over there. 15, 16 year old, we don't send the... Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Right, and you were only coming to Jaywalk, but they, you, I remember that the coaches were also saying, okay, Jaywalk is, you know, the world champs for juniors, but at the same time, we are looking more into the future. And this is just a stepping stone towards yeah. the towards the walk and this is what yeah. we are focusing on which uh, which is quite cool but at the same time i think you have more competitions that of the very high level around you during the season where you yeah. uh, you get the chance to perform with the best in the world because even yeah. even among swedish runners only it's still a very fierce competition isn't it yeah exactly so yeah. We, we don't get that in poland for example that there is not uh, th there aren't enough people in the sport to make uh, one class during the competition as challenging as it can be in Sweden, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, Might be. Then, when you when you went from from juniors to the elite class, how did how did this change feel like? I think for for some seasons you uh, you, you didn't definitely go into the elite class and wow, I'm at the, at the top. You know, I'm I'm a strong as uh, I felt in, in my junior class that I can compete at the same level place-wise uh, when I was in my junior class. Uh, but at the same time, when I looked through um, the results, I, it, it looks like you were steadily climbing and climbing higher and higher in the hierarchy until you started to get world oriented championship medals and top results in a, in a um, World Cup as well. Yeah, yeah I, I think... Uh... The transition was a bit easier because I started to run uh, senior competitions when I was 20 mm -hmm. um, because I, I really wanted to uh, qualify for the World Cup in uh, yeah northern uh, in Östfold. No, yeah, I think it was. No, it was in Sweden, Munkedal and uh, Lyskil. Okay. Yeah, but I was living in Halden uh, by that time, so I was... Yeah, I saw it as a nice opportunity to focus on the, those competitions and also like a bit of a chance to make the transition over to uh, 21 class a bit easier. Uh, but yeah, I, I knew that the goal was set high to be qu uh, qualified as a junior to the World Cup, but I managed to be qualified for the for the middle, middle distance and sprint. Yeah. Um, and I was running that as a junior, uh, and uh, then yeah, as a senior, I was focusing on on walk in um, and I I managed to be selected for sprint uh, back then, uh, and yeah, I think I was I was really the last girl in in the team, <laughs> but uh, it was really nice that they of the youngest they as believed well. in me and got me and it, yeah gave me the chance to to run of course i i had proved it on on uh selection races but yes. uh yeah it was a tight race between other strong women but uh yeah i was really happy to get that spot and uh yeah yeah i think uh, i was quite lucky to <laughs> to have a good start of the senior career cool and and then when you started competing with the best in the world um you saw that there is there is a gap, yeah. So, so you were one of the best juniors uh, in the world, right? At that point in yeah. time, and then you started to compete with uh, the elite class, and there was a mm -hmm. gap between you and the top. Where do you feel this gap 
was coming from? Was it technical performance or physical mm -hmm. shape that you had to catch up with or maybe both or something else? Uh, I think it was quite both. Maybe most the physical shape. I, I always been uh, yeah, quite good at technique. I, 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 I shouldn't jinx this now, but I seldom do like really big mistakes and stuff like that. It's mostly like small mistakes and uh, maybe that the speed is not good enough. Uh, but of course, those two are going hand in hand. And uh, if you're in good sh physical shapes, the, the technical part is getting easier also. So you you don't make as, as big mistakes when you're in good shape. Um, but of course, yeah, when you talk about the gap between me and the, the 21 uh, women, when I um, changed class, it's, it's uh, I have been training with those for a long time. We were at training caps together with the with the senior team and yeah it feels like I knew I knew the gap from when when I was a junior also it wasn't like a surprise that I was so far behind Tove and Helena Weiman and, and those strong women so uh, yeah can you can you quanti quantify that gap to just say how big of a gap was it for example in terms of how many seconds per kilometer you were slower compared to Tuva, for example? Uh, no, I mean, it was different from every training or race. So, yeah, or I, I didn't really get the question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm trying to see how big of a difference there was, because that's always interesting, you know, when people are jumping from the junior category to the elite category, it's it's very hard for even the best juniors in the world to, to start immediately competing at the elite class level to yeah. get to, to get to the top, which feels kind of normal and okay, right? right? Because uh, yeah. the, the people in the elite class, they had many more years of training behind yeah. them. So yeah. obvi obviously, naturally, that their shape should be, physical shape should be better. But I'm always wondering, what is this gap? You know, And there are some exceptions mm -hmm. to the rule, like I think Casper Fosser might be one of those exceptions, yeah. Because he had almost no like, I don't want to say empty years, and empty in terms of medals, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you jumped to the elite class and you were mm -hmm. still very good. Yeah, I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want it to sound bad. You were still very good, but you were yeah. not able to compete for the medals. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, because there was this gap, and I'm trying to figure out how big of a gap was it. So if you were like uh, started to race to the uh, shoulder to shoulder, you know, ha on the track and race for four kilometers, five kilometers, for example, how fast, how much faster would she be during that such a race without the map? Oh, uh, maybe on a 3K uh, test race, she would be maybe, yeah, one, one minute faster, I think, maybe okay. in that time. So it's about 20 seconds per kilometer. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, more, more or less what I imagine. I imagine something between twenty and thirty seconds per yeah. kilometer between the like the, the best juniors and um, uh, the people that are at the top at the time. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I think you got your first medal results during the World Olympic Champs, two thousand twenty-one Czech Republic. Am I right? Uh, yeah, yeah. The relay medals, yeah. Yes, relay medals, both relays actually, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, congratulations. Um, what helped you get to this uh, to this level that allowed you to compete for the medal positions at WOC, finally? Yeah, I think it, uh, <laughs> it's been strange to say it, but I think it was thanks to Corona. I, I The Corona virus or the pandemic uh, yeah. time, because I, I trained a lot during those uh, years and I try I got a lot of time at home ground. Uh, and I think it was uh, like a good uh, change for me. I, I started to train a lot of threshold training, uh, got a bit uh, inspired by uh, this Ingebrigtsen method, um, doing double threshold Tuesday, Thursday, and then fast session on Saturday and slow sessions um, in between. So yeah, I think that Corona year, we, uh, me and uh, my boyfriend Oscar, we were training like this week, every week, uh, the same like Ingebrigtsen uh, method, and uh, yeah, it was nice. We bought a lactate meter to like 
yeah, really have the cool. Uh, yeah, like yeah, the statistics of everything. Yeah. It was really fun, and uh, yeah, when there was no competitions, this was a fun method of training. Uh, of course, it sounds really boring to just run like threshold training, but uh, for us, it was uh, it was a nice uh, thing. And uh, I think I got uh, several weeks uh, without any injuries and sickness. Of course, that's a big uh, thing. Always, always helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I felt like I was in really good shape in the spring of 21. And uh, when I feel I'm in good shape, I also, also get a bit more uh, motivated to focus more on, on the specific yeah, walk or so, because always it's a big issue if you are selected or not, and if you put a lot of effort into preparing for walk and then you're not selected, it feels like really, really bad. So I think it's a scary thing to focus on walk. But this year I felt like yeah, I can, I can, re I think I can be quite sure about not sure about the spot at walk, but that I can perform on the test races and yeah. So uh, I was spending a lot of time in Czech Republic. Uh, I really liked the country, like traveling around, uh, running on on nice uh, sandstone maps and, uh, and so. And uh, yeah, I had really good technical preparations for that type of terrain. So I think that helped a lot for the for the, both the test races and the walk, of course. Awesome. It's super nice to hear that there, has, there was actually some factor that maybe contributed to a better physical form in the end, uh, because yeah. very often what I hear is just, you know, I was, I was training, 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 get the better, better, better every year until I finally uh, reached yeah. uh, a certain level, which allowed me to compete for the top spot. Or um, sometimes, you know, there was just this one or two performances that just were amazing, but it's very hard to get to that place. It's not the same for you because from at least from 2021, you seem like consistently performing very, very well on the national mm. level, which is awesome. Um, mm. Before I move away from this topic, can you explain to, to the viewers what a threshold training is? Um, yeah, it's um, when you don't feel the acid in your legs, uh, sort of the sourness, uh, when you get really tired. Um, and uh, yeah, it, you should, it's some different, uh, things that you could yeah measure it in uh, if you have a lactate meter it's it's about it individual of course but we try to lay beyond uh, or um, under 2.8 in uh, millimole per liter yeah and uh, yeah that's in morning session and in the afternoon session it's four uh, millimole per liter um so and yeah the feeling should be like quite relaxed uh, but still yeah you try to run like fast so you should some people say you should be able to talk uh, when you run in threshold but for me it's uh, I cannot talk I feel uh, my breathing is too too heavy but uh, still I measure low so I know that my my breathing is heavy when I when even then when if I'm under threshold so I think I have quite my of course everyone is different uh, but I think I realized that for my uh, running yeah, for my running profile, uh, I my threshold is quite close to my uh, top speed, but I don't get as um, as tired uh, the day after, or I don't get yeah, um, it don't affect me as much as if I go above the threshold. So I always try to, or always, but on the threshold trainings, I try to stay under the threshold. Uh, so then I can recover for the afternoon session and st still be on the threshold and, and then get a good orienteering session the day after and then do a double threshold again in the, in the next day. So you can, you, uh, for me, it was like I, I was able to put in a lot, of, a lot more training uh, without being so tired. Yes. Um, yes. And my pulse was almost the same uh, as when I ran fast. So I got a lot more hours in high pulse zones uh, than before. And uh, yeah, I was training yeah, more in that. So <laughs> you also do uh, um, tests from time to time, like probably every several months to check your uh, lactate acid level uh, levels. At, uh... No, 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 no lab tests or so. We have a, a 
a loop in Göteborg called Grusotan, uh, which is like eight kilometers of gravel. It's really nice and uh, yeah, it's more natural, nature, uh, and it's, yeah, really nature uh, area and, and nice, but that's it. That's kind of a test loop, which we did every Thursday morning um, during the, almost during the whole year, maybe not so much in competition season, but so that was quite a uh, test race where I felt like if I measured high in a, in a slower speed, I was, I knew that maybe the Friday should be a bit easier than than it used to then yeah then mostly i was fit for the past session on saturday again okay so, yeah. cool i think i will come back to the physical training part uh but before i do i want to move on and i want to get to the question uh, which is always very interesting to me so when i was talking with lisa uh i i have you seen the chat with lisa uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so I'll, at, I'll at, at some at some point in time, I asked her uh, when uh, you you were running the relay together for the medal in Czech Republic, and uh, you you were running the second, second leg, leg, right? Yeah. So when when she was giving you a change, she said something to you. Oh. Yeah, uh, you don't have to remember because I know what she said. She told me. Uh, so yeah, okay. I, I asked her about it because I thought that maybe she was giving uh, you some kind of yeah, info from the course. Um, what, what to watch out for? You know, be careful at oh, yeah. number seven because there is something, something, right? Uh, and I was curious, so I asked her, and and yeah. uh, her answer was t totally surprising to me because she said that she told you um, that Sarah, you're going to love this race and the terrain. Yeah, just yeah. go, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember it when you said it now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, um, and and when I asked her more about it, she said that you know uh, she 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 knows that you are such a technically good runner, uh, which you said as well that you're just going to uh, have so much fun in this kind of a terrain and have a good yeah. race. Uh, so, being a good technical runner, what do you think is the most important? skill for an orienteer or orienteer if you if you were to pick just one what, what would it be oh uh, i think in in every type of terrain uh it's really hard question but i, I think it's maybe the direction uh if you if you have a good direction then it's always you always get to the control almost right uh, so I think that's the most, most important. It's quite funny that I say this as advice because I use a wrist compass. This, uh, I, I will see if I find it. I know, I, I no? saw it on one of the photos. Yeah, yeah. And that's not the best uh, for direction, actually. But uh, yeah, I think I use the features a bit more to like correct my direction uh, a lot. Uh, so that's why I'm a bit better when it's more technical terrain, I think compared to when it's like, uh, yeah, not so much features and, and so. So yeah, I think, yeah, it was also my main focus in, in Nor uh, World Cup in Norway to have a good direction um, because there every meter costs so much, uh, yeah, energy. And so, so if you try to keep like the shortest way and have a good direction, then, then you gain a lot of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, how how do you so how how often do you look at the compass during the race? Do you feel like you're doing it constantly, or just at some intervals? Uh, sometimes you're totally fine navigating by the features only. How does it work for you? Yeah, I think I could. Uh, I have been running some trainings as so well without compass, so uh, I think it's. But then I correct my direction with the features, so the direction doesn't have to rely on the compass yeah uh it's a, yeah it's hard to explain it but yeah i have i have the the leg between the fingers and then my compass on the on the wrist sort of so um i always have the compass with me uh, but i have to like remind me to put the map after the compass all the time uh, because otherwise i always uh, like uh, locate the map after the features so you can use the features to have a good direction, uh, Absolutely. sort of. But at the same time, it's uh, you feel like you, you are looking at the compass, although you have to remind yourself from time to time to remember about it. Yeah, yeah, sort of. <laughs> okay. So um, 
do you do any special training that uh, or training sessions that are focused on using the compass? Um, no, not so much. It, I think it's a lot of uh, it's a part of the orienteering all the time. Um, do you remember doing you... them when you were younger, as a child? Yeah, yeah. Then we had more like compass training uh, um, sessions, sort of. But nowadays, I don't do those kind of multi technique uh, trainings so much. It's more of a trying to set the right uh, like techniques doing a normal course sort of but yeah, I, yeah they could be help, helpful when you're in the beginning of the career i think yeah I, I think that at your level you kind of assume okay i know how to write run with the compass <laughs> yeah so yeah, you don't have of. to have special trainings but maybe uh, in the springtime you need to remind yourself i think i always feel a bit rusty in the springtime uh, so then i have to start over with all the orienteering technique uh, skills i have a small book where i write uh, like uh, all the things uh, like well, what I should focus on for big races and so and then it's in the beginning of the season it's always like the basic stuff like yeah f uh, focus on the direction and uh, have a good last uh, last secure point before you attack uh, attack points I mean and uh, yeah those really basic stuff and then the longer in the season I go the the um, notes are more spe specific to the terrain and yeah not not so much basic anymore how often do you update those notes yeah uh, before every imp important comp uh, competition sort of okay and then and then you so you you sit down you think about okay what this competition is going to look like how the terrain is going to be what yeah. is going to be important for me you take notes do you, do you read them before the start later on Ah, if I get nervous, <laughs> I think it's quite a good, I mean, the thing I do is mostly to prepare mentally and I do it by writing. You can do it by painting or whatever. It feels like it's helping me to relax and uh, to feel that I, I have the confidence. I know how to work here. Um, so yeah, that's, it's a good, uh, yeah, it's a good way to lose the tension a bit before. Yeah, I, I love this topic. You know, I love love talking about this uh, focus, concentration, uh, stress before uh, before the start, because I feel like the, at 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 some point, at some level, this becomes a very important factor. So you're already yeah. good technically, uh, you're prepared physically. So the only yeah. thing that can stand in your way from reaching uh, your your goals is if if you screw up and you usually screw up mm. because uh, you're not prepared a, a, enough mentally or you're stressed yeah. uh, or something gets in your way that you um, didn't think about for the race yeah, yeah. And, and i think that having you know the, the notes that are kind of allowing you to get into the right zone for the start and you know, read them um, mm -hmm. or even writing them before and then reading them is sorry it's part of the process that is really really helpful in this area yeah so the all the training and um, the preparation you did um led you to the world cup this year and the your performance during the world cup was absolutely top top notch of course it, it doesn't mean that uh you will be able to maintain it through the rest of the year but it's definitely an amazing prognostic for it and you were able to compete at the very highest level, fighting uh, very closely with Tuve, uh, both in middle distance and in the long distance. You were able to uh, win one of those, uh, which was super interesting to watch <laughs> with, uh, with the coverage. Uh, uh, we, we saw it online. And, you know, I think that the difference actually came with Tuve just going through the marsh and tripping over yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, is, this, is, this is all it had to... Uh, I can say it was really happen. interesting to follow from the finish line also. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> and, and, I, and I mean, uh, <laughs> basically very, very, um, very few races are so enticing when it comes to orienteering as the last World Cup. So it was, it was absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's nice um, and I know that you're also aiming for the individual medal in, in World Orienteering Champs. Is it yeah. safe to say that this is one of the goals, your dreams that you're pursuing right now? uh yeah yeah 
I think so. <laughs> so, so how do you feel about your um, performances at this World Cup? And do you think it, it puts you in the right position to dream about hitting those individual gold medals, not gold medals, but medals in general during 2023 yeah. this year? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Of course, it's, it gets easier to get confidence that uh, I have the ability to run that path that is, uh, that is um, required. Um, but of course, I know that people will, uh, their shape will increase and people have had some struggles with, uh, with sickness and, and injuries. And I haven't had so much problems with that. So I know that I shouldn't be comfortable with that. This is my new niveau and uh, that people are not uh, able to follow that. Uh, so I really have to put effort in the coming month now uh, in uh, before uh, walk and of course get selected for, for walk. Um, it, even though you win a World Cup race, uh, you cannot be 100% sure that you will run walk. Absolutely. But at the same time, you know, other people will get better, but you have a chance to get better as well. So it's like an even yeah. race, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we will see and walk. <laughs> I, we will definitely see. But I think you're in a, in, in a great shape this year and an amazing starting position to fight for those medals. So I will definitely be uh, rooting for you and holding my thumbs so yeah. that your dream comes true. Although at the yeah. same time, I have to say that throughout all the conversations I've had so far in the channel, I don't think that there are enough medal spots for everyone to get those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some, someone, someone will have to, you know, get uh, the position outside of the podium. But at the same yeah. time, I feel uh, that uh, if... If you're able to give it your best and have yeah. an amazing performance and even miss the medal uh, despite yeah. despite having an amazing race, it's yeah. still a huge satisfaction point and nothing yeah. to be said about. Yeah, and I think that's uh, I, I I realized it more and more the older I get that it's more of the the journey is the is the goal sort of. I really love this life traveling around uh, trying to get just a little bit better in this type of terrain and uh, yeah uh, meeting people from other countries and uh, yeah I think it's uh, in the end I think I will not look back on the medals uh, when I when I stop volunteering it's it's more of the memories from from the training camps and from the like the championships and, and stuff like that so I mean it's, we're doing the greatest sport in the world and uh, only that is is yeah enough to be happy i mean people with who who are doing boring sports for them the medals are are really important but i think our sport is so much fun and i think people who are doing orienteering loves it a bit bit more than uh, than people doing other types of sports it feels like that <laughs> I wouldn't be able to say it in any better words. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back a little bit to the physical preparation training because I have a few more questions regarding that. How much do you train in general? You've mentioned that sometimes you're doing even two training sessions per day. Uh, yes, it depends a lot of which season, of course, if Absolutely. it's uh, winter or summer or competition or not. But uh, yeah, when I was a junior and yeah, uh, first year of senior, I was really taking notes on my training and having like really good statistics on it but uh, nowadays I go more for feeling and uh, and don't take so much statistics but yeah I, I, I measure it since I use Strava I measure it in uh, in kilometers per week yeah. and that's like it's it, I know it's quite rough because orienteering costs a lot of more uh, energy than normal running so you cannot only look at this but uh, yeah, there I can see a bit how my progress is and so, but uh, there I try to, in winter, I try to run like, yeah, about 120 to 130 kilometers per week. And that's, yeah, now it's, now when I've been in Italy for the preseason, I, that has like been almost 14, 15 hours a week, uh, almost only running uh, when I'm, when I'm not injured, I, it feels like it's easier to get the training in running. So, yeah, it's, uh, 
I think I'm at my at my limit almost the whole winter, but it feels like as long as I don't push the that uh, tipping point too much, it's I, I I really get the feeling since I do the same training every week. I really get the feeling if I'm a bit uh, tired, uh, then I just put, it's, very, uh, it's very comparable. Yeah, you can you can see how you're yeah, performing yeah. compared to the so week then before, I just have to take before. it easy one day or just push the program like one day further, and then I can be back in the, in the program. Interesting. So that's for me that has been quite successful. I think uh, for finding the right amount of training. Very interesting. Um, do you write your training plans yourself? Uh, it's me and uh, my boyfriend Oscar who is uh, yeah discussing it a lot like not we don't write it down but it's more like yeah this week we do this and he is also focusing on orienteering so we are having all, almost the same uh, training plan and doing a lot of sessions together so I, I think, I, really I think nice. I've seen him on some of the photos on your Instagram on training camp so you must yeah. be traveling together sometimes yes yes we are <laughs> okay cool very nice very nice um, all right so a very interesting thing is that you said that you're kind of going with the same training regime week after week. And do you, um, well, I guess that you do modify them depending on the season. So it probably looks a bit different in winter and yeah. a bit different in spring and during the competition period. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly in winter. I have the same same training every week. Right. And of course, it differs a bit if it's, I mean, in Göteborg, we have a lot of uh, common trainings like nightcaps and yeah. stuff like that. So I try to adapt to to join those sessions, and then every week is not the same. But I, yeah, I try to have it as equal as possible. Um, and uh, in in spring uh, or competition season, of course, it's it's a lot about resting and uh, trying to, yeah, take your form, uh, like in a good amount uh, because you cannot be be um saved for every competition uh so yeah there, there is a bit more tricky and you and there i think i doubt a bit more on my training uh, so that's a yeah it's it's more of a tricky season even though it's nice to run a bit faster and step out of the threshold training uh i think it's yeah, I, I like the winter training. Uh, ah, they both are are good. <laughs> how, how do you how do you um, or where do you where do you have those training sessions during winter? Um, do you do you live in Göteborg? Are you in Göteborg right now? Yeah, I live in Göteborg. So yeah. h- how how is the snow conditions during winter? Are really good. No snow. <laughs> ah, okay. We have like uh, maybe one or two weeks where it comes like snow uh, storm or something like that but it melts mo- of often really fast okay that's maybe the big difference between Göteborg and, and east of sweden uh, that the snow is is gone after like one week or so but then also i i like to do skiing so i often travel up to uh, sjukan in norway uh, for skiing so uh, yeah i think it's and it's only five hours from Göteborg, so that's really good uh, I think Göteborg is a really nice place to be for me. Good. Um, I, I love the city, by the way. I've been there once on, oh. on a business trip some years ago already. Yeah. I think I think it was my first time when I actually visited Sweden back then. And yeah, I, absolutely, yeah. I absolutely love the city. It was very nice. Yeah. It's a bit rough. It's uh, sort of a harbor city, but uh, it's really charming. Uh, we have that famous artist, uh, Håkan Hellström, which I love. And uh, yeah, he's singing a lot about the... Uh, like spirit of the city and oh, yeah. I didn't know that. It's not perfect, but like I mean, the city is not perfect. But uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know if it's possible to find a perfect place. No, <laughs> <laughs> but there's always something, but uh, there are definitely better and worse places. Yeah, and I think Göteborg is is among those better ones. Okay, <laughs> um, so we don't already talked, I think, about your favorite training type. Is it safe to say that this is threshold training session? uh yeah maybe I, I think it's hard to find a favorite training of course i i do orienteering so i love i love the orienteering sessions those are better than the threshold trainings but i, I think every <laughs> session has a has a charm so uh, yeah but i would say orienteering like a relay training or or like uh 
yeah, night training here in training. That could be like really, really cool. <laughs> By the way, talking about the night training, how do you feel about the changes that are coming to Tumida next year? Yeah, as I talked about before, with changes, I'm uh, I'm quite skeptical in the beginning. So that, that's where I'm uh, where I am now. <laughs> quite skeptical, but uh, yeah, I hope it's not. I think it's it's quite a big risk for the sport to uh, to change so fast. Uh, with especially with the seven seven women in the team part because it's hard for smaller clubbers yes. clubs to find people but i hope in in long term that it will have an effect that people are more uh, uh, important as it is in team lack of they're they're the small clubs they have to uh convince people to run and uh, people have to train during the whole winter to be in shape for Timila even though they're not elite runners yeah so I hope that could be an outcome of this uh more people in the women relay so um yeah we'll see but I think it's a risk that people are are not getting enough people in a team and then then stop with orienteering and it's oh, only interesting the I, I thought that this shouldn't be a problem in Scandinavia because you usually have quite big clubs, at least compared to my standards from Poland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's I, I mean, it's the same problem, or what you say, as in normal society with urbanization and people are moving to the bigger city, and and uh, the smaller cities are getting smaller. Uh, I see. And and uh, yeah, I think. This is quite, it, it has been a trend in our interior world that people are, the, the bigger club, clubs are getting bigger and the smaller are getting smaller. So I think that's a bit frightening in our interior uh, because it's a really nice thing that every small city has a club and the, which is active and so, but yeah, I hope it will remain like that even after this, uh, this change in Tidemila. I guess that we will see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, the night uh, for women is also nice. I, I think uh, it's it's also a, a, a question about uh, getting used to it, I guess. People like night when they're out, but maybe not so much before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I thought so as well. I thought that the, this change that some part of the relay will be held at night I think it's going to be interesting because uh, I always thought that it's strange that men are allowed to l run at night and women yeah. don't have any yeah. night night legs. I, I thought that it was strange during Tumila. So I, I like this part yeah. of the change. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you joined Tumila sometime? I've been there three times. One time I wasn't there as a competitor, just as a spectator. Second time mm -hmm. I was supposed to run. Uh, so me and my wife, we were in the Tabby OK club. Yeah. And okay. um, she she was running in uh, maybe even the first team or maybe the second team. I don't remember. I, I was running like in a, in a third one, I think, or something like this. But, okay. dur but during my second visit to Tiomila, the, I had a leg in the morning. So it was mm -hmm. al already sunrise. But my my team was not performing good enough to allow me to run because I, otherwise I would uh -huh. be late for my plane. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So unfortunately, oh, no. the guy that was running before me, she took uh, he took uh, so much time in the forest that I unfortunately couldn't start anymore because okay. I, I know that I would be late for my flight. So we had to leave. Yeah. But the third time we came to Tiomila, I was, I was able to, to race and it was a lot of fun, basically. The, okay. um, the competition is amazing, although I have to say that it, uh, it's, it's also very demanding when you actually have to stay up through most of the night or the yeah. sl sleeping facilities maybe are not that comfortable you sleep in a tent which is not yeah. warm warm I, I remember that yeah. after the first two meetings we came back home and we immediately bought uh, better sleeping bags for ourselves because i, yeah. I said that i will never sleep in these kind of conditions again because it's no. not possible <laughs> Um, yeah. But but at, at the same time, I also the person that likes these challenging conditions. So it was fun in the end. It was definitely fun. Yeah. Uh, although um, I, I never like going somewhere far, uh, and it's it's not super far to go to to Sweden to Tiamila from Poland. But it's still like a day trip one way, day trip back. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't like going there for just one competition. So if there's, for yeah. example, like a training camp before it or after it, 
then I'm absolutely yeah. for it. Uh, I can go for a week, but just going for one competition, one race, and spend two days mm -hmm. traveling, that's not much fun for me. Yeah. But of course, you from Sweden and every other people from Sweden or Scandinavia in general, it's a different story because yeah. for, for many of you, it's much closer. For some of you, it's still quite far, probably, coming from yeah. somewhere far north. Uh, but yeah. uh, but still, I, I know that Tiomila is uh, a huge part of your history when it comes to orienteering. Mm -hmm. And it's it's absolutely a different thing for us uh, than it is for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what's something that people don't know about you? Oh, yeah. Normal people, like not your family or friends, but uh, you know, people no. uh, from your national team, for example. Yeah, when, um, when I uh, studied uh, at university, I sometimes uh, had popcorn for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I think many, many, many of the viewers will uh, be able to appreciate this and connect it with yeah. their own experiences, me included. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily popcorn, but something that widely is not considered food in general. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it was popcorn and carrots sometimes. Oh, interesting <laughs> connection. Like, yeah, I thought I should have some kind of uh, like uh, healthiness in, in that kind of diet. But so, I don't know if I managed with the carrots. Interesting. <laughs> that actually reminded me uh, a fun fact from my side. Um, so I'll bounce the ball back, if yeah. you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Popcorn reminded me about cinemas. And uh, I had a six-year period when I was working in a bank. And at some point when we were working in a bank, um, you know, you work sometimes doesn't um, involve you 100%. So there are periods where there is lots of work. Sometimes there are periods where it's a little bit boring, you know? Yeah. And in a bank, we had those periods as well. And I was uh, asking sometimes to be allowed to work from home because I know that, you know, coming to the office for eight hours doesn't really make sense because I can do what I have to do in four hours. And the rest of the yeah. time, I'm still spending on the internet doing nothing, basically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also at that point in time, I was quite young and I didn't understand that uh, actually I can use this time better. Uh, so I yeah. was, wasn't motivated enough to spend this time in a better way. So we figured uh, with my friend that uh, we, can, we can actually go and watch movies in the cin cinema during our work hours. So sometimes we were yeah. just leaving the office saying that, okay, we are going for a meeting and we are going to the cinema, which was 100 meters next to our office okay. building, and <laughs> watching a movie, coming back to work and like, okay, the, the rest of the day is, is for you guys. See you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Spending the time wisely. <laughs> yeah. Silly things we do when we are young. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Last question I have on, on the list, and I will let you go. Who was your idol when you were growing up? Um, and I'm assuming it it it's connected with orienteering, but it doesn't have to be if you have someone else in mind. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I had a lot of idols. It felt like I was surrounded by, or not surrounded, but the world was filled with people who was inspiring, and so. It still but, is. Uh, I think the one that was. Uh, in, in my sight, uh, almost all the time, it was Helena Johansson, and now she's uh, Helena Bayman. She was a big role model because she, she was from the neighbor city uh, of mine, mm -hmm. and it was just like four uh, miles away. So uh, yeah, that was really cool to see her succeed from, from a smaller city, and uh, and yeah, she was really nice and kind, and uh, yeah, I think she was a big role model for me. And also, uh, yeah, Jenny Johansson from the Um, She was also like really big when I was in that uh, star uh, or like that fan age. Uh, so, so I was, I remember one time me and my friend Amanda was out uh, on a competition uh, and it was an elite competition at the same time where we were asking people for autographs. Mm -hmm. And we took everyone with a number bib. So we came to ask like juniors who was just starting in a, in, in the competition to have an autograph. And they were a bit surprised, but we was not like, yeah, you have a number bib, you're really fast. <laughs> so I think I was starstruck of everyone being quite good in orienteering. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I like this answer very much because it, it shows like sometimes how important it is for 
uh, the top athletes to spend a bit of time sharing their energy with the fans out there on the yeah, yeah. Uh, on the on the arena. And I think most of them are doing it. Maybe all of them. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not monitoring it definitely. So who knows? Uh, but uh, I, I think it is important and it helps yeah. it to get people inspired, you know, and yeah, yeah. raise their energy yeah. levels, keep them going through tougher periods during the year. Uh, yeah, and, and the training sessions. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Cool. All right, Sarah. This has been uh, an amazing chat. I really think that you're a, a wonderful person. I feel like we have quite a lot in common uh, when, yeah, it, when yeah. it comes to orienteering, and we think along the same lines sometimes, uh, yeah. which 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 I think is a common thread among the people that I'm talking to over here. So mm -hmm. maybe it's more about the community itself that is similar in general. Maybe the, yeah, the, yeah. the orienteering attracts the similar-minded people. Maybe that's what it is. But I don't yeah. know. This was really interesting. Uh, first of all, to know you, then to listen about different aspects of your life and orienteering career and your preparation. And uh, I can definitely feel the love to orienteering that you have in your heart. And uh, I definitely have it too. And I've, I'm sure that lots of people watching this uh, also will be able to sign up under this. So thank you so much for spending the time here, uh, sharing your thoughts with me, but also through me with all the people that will be watching this. An amazing time. Yeah, thank you. It was a really nice conversation. <laughs>